Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, January 8th, 2019 business meeting of the Olympia City Council. For the record, council met earlier this evening for a closed session to discuss labor relations and a, or negotiations and a, an executive session uh, pursuant to a real estate matter. No decisions were made. Uh, as for the record as well, our first meeting of the year, we are all present, so we have uh, a quorum. And at this time, I'd like to invite Kelly Purse Brosseth, our strategic, strategic, I can never say strategic, strategic communications <laughs> director uh, to update us on some of the work that's been happening. We haven't met for a few weeks and there's a lot going on in the city at all times. And uh, one of those things that we we're able to do was update our, uh, our website on specifically the tab on homelessness. So Kelly. Thank you, Mary Selby. Council members, happy new year. It's a pleasure to be before you again. Kelly Purse Brossett, Strategic Communications Director. It's a mouthful. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to tell you about the work that we've been doing around uh, communicating to the public around uh, what the city is doing around homelessness. Um, we have been uh, working with uh, communication services staff, has been working with uh, CP&D staff to um, update the website and um, sort of frame our activities um, that we're taking, that the city is doing um, to take on and address a regional crisis. And um, so I'm just going to walk you through uh, the, uh, the, the, the web page. Um, one of the key things, and I'll do this, see, uh, I wanted you to, to point out is um, we've attached a video. Uh, uh, we did a video with uh, Colin DeForest, our homeless response coordinator, where um, he attempts to give an overview that kind of pulls together all the threads of the activities that the city has been doing, why we're doing it, what we hope to accomplish, um, and um, this has been shared widely and pretty well received. Um, the other thing that you'll see is, um, I'm going, I'm looking up there, um, links to all of the uh, activities that we've been doing. Each of them have their own individual uh, page so we could go into some detail and, uh, and the public can uh, learn more deeply about what's going on. Um, I wanted to just point out a couple of them, pull them out and talk a little bit about them. One of them being the mitigation site. Um, as you can see, uh, the mitigation sites are, uh, the site was set up on uh, the city-owned parking lot on, at Olympia of Franklin. Uh, the, the purpose of it, was, of it was to provide a level of order and safety and dignity and cleanliness as opposed to the unmanaged, unsanctioned site, it's actually one of them right across the street. And I'd like to, give, to show you an example of, of what that looks like. This is an, an aerial photo taken on the same day of, uh, on the right is the uh, unmanaged, unsanctioned site on State Avenue um, that um, citizens pass by. Um, and across the street is the mitigation site. As you can see, there's a, there's a, a, a distinct difference. Just for clarification for our audience, the, the city sanctioned mitigation site is north of the transit center. Right. So it's not right next door, it's kind of kitty yeah, corner. Well, kind of cross the street from each other. But yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. I just, so when people drive by on state, that's not the mitigation that, that site. That is not the mitigation site. It's, it's a little farther up. So absolutely. Um, so you can see it's pretty striking difference between the two. Um, so just to give you a, a, some uh, current uh, updates about the mitigation site, right now currently there are about 70 tents serving about 90 people on the site. Uh, we're working to get electricity uh, to the site to power the two tiny homes that the site hosts will live in or, or live in right now. Um, yesterday power lines went up and uh, we're currently waiting for some work from PSC to get that all going. So that's, that's some progress. Approximately, there are approximately 30 remaining sites um, to be filled on there. Um, and January 15th, they are, they're, they're set to move in some folks, um, and our staff will be meeting with the service providers this week to sort of lock down the details around that. The other piece I want to make sure just to pull out from this is the Plum, the Plum Street Village. Um, so this is 
Um, the tiny home village, the city is contracting with the Low Income Housing Institute um, to uh, provide operations. We're leasing the property to them and, they, and we're providing funding for operation of the site, but they're operating and managing it for us. Um, on, uh, currently on Saturday, well, first let me say that um, this has been um, a really kind of nice to see how the members of the community and council members have uh, volunteered and uh, their talent and their time to show up on the site and work parties to, to build the tiny homes. So right now, as of Saturday, 23 of the 29 uh, tiny homes are complete and on the site. On January 17th, Lehigh will be hosting another information meeting for the public at the Olympia Center. And then on January 31st, um, Lehigh will be hosting an open house on the site for the public from 3 to 6 p.m. Um, the uh, folks will start moving in the first week of February. And currently, the, we are, or Lehigh is identifying residents using the coordinated entry process. So um, that's that. And then the other thing I want to make sure everyone um, takes note of on the site is you'll see that there is a site there, there's a page for just homelessness data. Um, there's information about the homeless census, about um, homelessness downtown. So if anybody wants to dig into that stuff, that is there. Um, and then the other piece on here is um, the, there's an opportunity for the community to sign up for, for email updates around homelessness and we'll be sending those out regularly um, it's important for our community and our, our residents to, um, to be informed so they know what we're doing and why we're doing it. We need their help. We need our regional partners' help. We need the state's help. And um, we hope to um, keep everyone informed. Are there any questions? Any questions for Kelly? Um, uh, Council Member Cooper. Not really a question, but thank you. Uh, it's really comprehensive now, and I especially appreciate Colin's video. I've had a chance to share it a few times, and I think it's getting good feedback from the community. So thank, thank you, Kelly and Colin and everybody involved. Thank you. So I just want to encourage everybody in the viewing audience at home, please check out the website, olympiawa.gov. There's a lot of, um, like I said, new information, and we're trying to figure out new ways to reach out to the community. Not everybody gets a paper or reads a paper anymore or... You know, social media is limited by the logarithms of, of or the algorithms of uh, Facebook and such. So please share um, what you can through your avenues of what we are doing um, and as well uh, advocate for a regional approach for uh, and, and help us uh, address this in a way that uh, can be even more impactful. So. And just want to point out the top of the web page are those dates for um, the information meeting and the open house. Details will follow around the open house as well. Thank you. All right, with that, I need a motion to approve tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have an agenda, which takes us to a very special, special recognition. Uh, item 2A, the City Council approved Sadie Sparks as the City's Poet Laureate on November 27, 2018, as part of Olympia's Poet Laureate Program, which began in 2017. It has become a tradition two years in a row, uh, that the Olympia's Poet Laureate will contribute a poem uh, to the council on the first council meeting of the year. And so this is our second Poet Laureate, so it's kind of still historic. So I'd like to invite Sadie Sparks up to the microphone to uh, share what she's written to share with us. Thank you, Mayor Selby and council members. Um, I'm Sadie Sparks, Olympia's newest Poet Laureate. And I'm going to read a poem called Eating Out of Season that is about the journey of a Chilean blueberry traveling up to Olympia and asks us to consider our habits this winter and if they are necessary. Eating Out of Season. Dusty blueberries in January have a sour burn, have traveled around 6,445.25 miles and make you slightly nostalgic. You remember pulling down clumps into your hand like grapes last September as Rachel told you about their silent brother. You remember walking to your neighbor's two bushes most mornings to collect toppings for your oatmeal. You remember the mothers that fill small glass containers for toddlers who like to suck on the white insides. You remember they had softer skin in the wild, 
had more juice and the sweetness was forever. You consider the truck journeying up from Chile, skin hardening through time zones, orchard home blurred to memory. You wonder if they are shipped as green and red babies and how exactly do they ripen? Is there sunshine in the truck? How many Chileans are snacking on blueberries tonight? You bet they are sweeter. You bet the laughter falls into hands like clumps. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm really excited to keep reading poems and connecting with the city and its individuals and creative ways. For me, poetry is really fun and playful. I wrote that poem. I was like, I have to write a poem to read. And so I went to the co-op looking for inspiration. I'm always inspired by food. And I got these blueberries because it sounded romantic to eat blueberries. And they were so bad. <laughs> Bless the co-op. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I was, and then I was like, where are these from? <laughs> and they're from um, 6,000 miles away. So that, yeah. <laughs> um, and in terms of my term, I've been meeting with city staff, making plans for the next two years already. And we're all really excited. Uh, and I will leave you with looking for typewriters at Arts Walk. Yeah. So can you explain what looking for typewriters at Arts Walk? Okay, I'll be less big. Um, there will be, yeah, my, my vision is to have um, different, lots of different individual poets on typewriters during Arts Walk all day to create that um, kind of big city art feeling. So yeah. Love it. Love it. Anybody else want to chime in? All right. You took us on a trip right there. <laughs> so thank you. It was a, you know, a few paragraphs. So yeah. look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great way to kick off the year. <laughs> All right. We're on to the evening's public comment period. And... Uh, this is a, a time where uh, citizens can address the city council on items related to city business, including items on tonight's agenda. If you've signed up on this sheet, I'm assuming you've read the rules, so I won't go over them. But basically, you have three minutes. I have a countdown clock over my right shoulder. We ask that everyone uh, refrain from clapping or, or any kind of other kind of outburst because we want everyone's voices to be heard and everyone to feel safe. And as well, there's public hearings that you... Uh, can't talk about that have been held in the last 45 days or, or any upcoming. Um, specifically, I'll call out the February 12th, we're going to have a public hearing on an ordinance designating residential targeted areas for multifamily tax exemption. So if you're here to talk about that, you'll have to wait for the public hearing. With that, I will start with, uh, we have less than 10 people signed up, so we'll get be able to get through everybody tonight. So I'll start with Sarah Pate, followed by Olivia Hart. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Pate. I'm a librarian in adult services at the Olympia Timberland Library, and I just came to give you some updates about what's going on there. Um, right now, we have our adult winter reading program. It's not just the kids who get to have all the fun in the summer. So um, we've got a um, book bingo challenge. So you can come and celebrate 100 years of the 19th Amendment by reading works by women authors um, and winning prizes. So basically, for each line um, you complete, you get an entry form, and you get a free book from the ongoing Friends of the Library book sale. And if you black out the whole card, you get uh, five extra entries. So and part of it is um, you can also talk to staff to get your recommendations to fill any of these. We're happy to help you fill them out, and we've got displays to help you, too. Um, in 2019, we're really focusing on getting out into the community even more, um, kind of beyond the four walls of our library. Um, so I want to let everybody in the community know that we are happy to come to your organizations, your places of business, um, to talk about any number of topics. Um, the most obvious is books, but there's much more. Um, we can talk about the best books of 2018, um, uh, anticipated titles of 2019, 
scene. We can talk about specific genres, mysteries, romance, nonfiction, sci-fi, whatever you, you want. Um, and we can also come out and do technology classes, like how to download free eBooks and audiobooks onto your phones, tablets, and other devices. Um, we can come and tell you how to use library resources to do in-depth research on pretty much any topic you can think of. Um, and we can do entire classes on library resources for small businesses. We actually already do these several times a year, but we can bring these out to um, your place. Um, we can talk about how to create competitors reports, business plans, um, and how to use Reference USA to do local market research. It's a, it's a product the library pays a lot of money for so that it's free for everyone in the community, and we can show you how to get in there and do in-depth research with it. Um, we can come and talk about resources for grant seekers, um, talk about all of our free online courses on topics like technology, professional development, but also leisure courses like cooking, painting, art, photography, all kinds of good stuff in there. Um, we can talk about our free language learning app that also includes um, free online conversation courses like practicing with other actual humans. That's a free thing you can do online. Um, and we can talk about our new online streaming service called Canopy with a K, where you can uh, stream five free films a month. And um, we can talk to you about the health benefits of reading for pleasure and help you get a book club started um, in your organization. So this is just you know a few of the things we can do. Um, and we're happy to, to help with these and much more. So call us to book a librarian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia Hart, followed by Kiana Reed. Olivia Hart. Oh, okay. So you can you can uh, approach. So did I spell your did I, I couldn't read T A L A U N A. It's Talana, Talana yeah. <clears throat> so I guess I started. So I'm back. And Steve Hall at the meeting on the 11th stated that he would call me back and has not. The prosecutor's office hasn't returned my calls and Detective Wining hasn't either. So I have some questions I would like to know regarding my aunt Yvonne McDonald's case. I would like to know why the street sweeper on August 7th didn't wait with a woman who, obvious, who was obviously victimized, he didn't, why he didn't wait with her, why he stopped his vehicle to remove a mailbox out of the road, saw a purse a few inches from the mailbox with ID and a checkbook outside of it, and 15 feet away observed her chest rising and falling and assumed she was un unconscious, um, saw no signs of injury, yet the photos included in the police report show her laying there bleeding with lacerations, contusions, and bruising, why he got back in his vehicle to continue on his route. <clears throat> I would like to know why the dispatcher um, did not ask him to wait, according to the log in the report, and why a woman badly injured and mostly naked appearing to be unconscious would only have dispatched one male police officer. It took 15 minutes for that police officer to arrive. I would like to know why that police officer, who's trained in how to respond to emergency situations, did not check for a pulse. Instead, he walked past her body a few and found her um, pers personal effects um, by her, she easily identifiable, didn't call her name out, didn't, didn't render any kind of aid, why he didn't cover her up and left her laying on the cold ground. <sighs> 15 minutes later, basic life support was dispatched. And I would like to know why the detective in this case support the notion from a paramedic trained in basic life support uh, by, when he would accept that he says that all her injuries were consistent with falling when he couldn't tell the difference between dirt and track marks on her arms because he administered, nar administered Narcon to her and later it was determined that it was dirt on her dark skin. I would like to know why the street sweeper returned to the scene and why his blood alcohol level wasn't tested, why the mailbox wasn't tested, paint samples or paint samples. The assessment anyone I've asked to make from all the factors, mailbox down, purse away from a, a naked woman, indicate some type of traffic accident, why the jacket that she had on her body disappeared. I would like to know why these questions weren't asked that day. I don't think this is anyone's fault, said the street sweeper. Yesterday when I met with the coroner, he insulted my intelligence and told me yesterday if she was hit by a vehicle, 
there would have been more extensive damage. How much more extensive does death have than death? That's pretty extensive. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Reeves, followed by Robert Bruce. Yes, my name is Jim Reeves. Uh, I'm also known as Moses. Yeah. So, yeah. This is the year, I think, that the big earthquake's going to hit. Some people have been asking me, when? What month? What day? What hour? Yeah. Well, you know. It's not easy to answer those questions. But I guess it's possible if you if I worked on it long enough. So uh is uh the scientists say this could be a very big earthquake like up in a nine magnitude or better. So uh yeah, I agree with that. That size of magnitude. Yeah. I think that the earthquake will probably wipe out this state that'll last so long, shake so hard. You know, it's what I, the message I get from reading my different sources, especially the Judeo-Christian Bible, talks about big earthquakes. God causing those big earthquakes as punishment for the unrepentant sins uh, of the people. You know, I guess we, we, uh, Need to be jumped on for our sins these days. <laughs> well, it's not always a free ride, you know. <laughs> you got to pay the price when you sin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Bruce, followed by Karma Reynoldson. Hi, Robert. Uh, I just wanted to express my disappointment over your action on No Set Lie. Uh, I, I'm disappointed that this unofficial ugly law is still on our books. I'm disappointed that this council's move towards problem solving instead of the quick fix of criminalization doesn't extend, I think logically, to allowing people, regardless of how they look, the right of basic rest, oftentimes denied to folks who are in the moment experiencing the worst moments of their lives. It's common knowledge that its enforcement is discriminatory against people who live on the streets, and we shouldn't kid ourselves about the political and social climate and attitudes towards homelessness that led to that clause. During the committee meeting, we heard from the police about how arrests are very rarely made, but the threat of the law is still used to move people. I'm very concerned that this use of the no sit lie ordinance creates a situation where there is no accountab accountability for the possibility of discrimination. That since arrests are rarely made, we don't have the records we need to address these concerns. At the very least, we should have some mechanism to create accountability here. And if there's opposition in council members' hearts to no sit lie, if you agree with me, but feel the pragmatic courses to wait, that we're trying to do big things and it's too much too soon. I would say that it, you should really take into account, you know, the people that are being moved, you know, and maybe consider the fact that it's like not your place to say or set the timeline, you know, for people to have, you know, equal rights to rest and respite. Um, I think there was a, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Carmel Reynoldson, followed by John Pettit. Mayor, City Council, thank you for letting me speak tonight. I have been seeing many business owners complain about the current homelessness situation. I often hear from people who complain about being too scared to come downtown because of homeless people, and I'm honestly finding this generalization of what's going on downtown really tiresome. I've been on both sides of this class divide. I was homeless when I was 18, now I'm 21, housed, and I'm a working student. 
I was born and raised here. Some of my most powerful memories, good and bad, happened downtown. I shop local when I can, even those shops whose owners have come out with particularly classist statements. I am foolish enough to remain civil with people who would have hated me when I was homeless. I love Olympia, but I have to be honest. Olympia is a mostly white city that likes to pretend it's diverse and tolerant, when in reality, Olympia's whiteness and classism makes it a hop, skip, and a jump away from being a country club. When it comes to the difference in the way I was treated as a homeless woman, and I am now, Olympia's brand of fake woke really shines through. I'll pull out the woman and bisexual card, and maybe Olympia's fake woke identity politics types will start listening to me. I will never find your brand of progressivism trustworthy, and many other people don't already. We have a homeless crisis. We have a disabled poverty crisis. We have a mental health crisis. We have a nationwide addiction crisis. My addict father is currently homeless. I lose sleep at night worrying about what would happen to my autistic brother if he were to end up homeless here. I worry about my friends, especially after over the years seeing several of them die. 60% of Olympia's homeless are physically or mentally disabled. That doesn't include the mentally ill, homeless K through 12 students, a number that's in the hundreds, domestic violence victims, and so many other populations that this society is just fine with mixing with drug dealers, pedophiles, and rapists. I would like to invite Olympia's business owners to stop sicking the cops on a vulnerable population simply for existing. Stop scapegoating those vulnerable populations. Stop being so awful. I sometimes go on early morning runs downtown. Yes, you heard that. A small, physically unimposed posing woman is less scared of downtown Olympia than grown men who have pathetically voiced their fears. I see people who are among those vulnerable populations sleeping rough. With the way things are going, it's going to get worse. It's delusional to expect hard times to be no different from good times. So many people think that Olympia is so different from the rest of the country, that it's going to look like a hippie version of Leave it to Beaver when the rest of the country is going to shit. An Olympia with tent cities and a culture of compassion is an Olympia I can take pride in. Thank you. I want to remind the audience that we want to refrain from profanity in your comments. This is broadcast over TCTV, and um, we want to keep it family friendly, so thank you for that. John Pettit, followed by Terry Ballard. Good evening, Council, Mayor. Um, first, I'm going to say this, is that, as you may recall, I was here a couple wh a while ago, last meeting, and I requested certain information. All I had was a simple question. Are you going to follow the ordinance that's in the books or not? Several weeks go by, and like somebody else over here, I get no response. It's typical, because your city manager doesn't care, and he isn't going to answer anybody that he doesn't want to. Now, I have several things. I won't be able to get them all in, but I'll try to surmise it quickly. First of all, the, uh, one of my big concerns here tonight is, is I know that you have an intention. There's something called a consent agenda. A consent agenda is a nice way to hide a lot of things that you want to slip through, but it doesn't make it legal what you're trying to do. In this particular case, Councilman Parsley can be the benefit of a gift from the city. Now, it doesn't label the gift. It's listed as a, an easement, but any element of a use of a property or use of a city asset for personal use is considered a gift. And I would be happy to leave the MRSC ruling to you about it, which describes it. I can assure you, you're breaking the Constitution, you do it. I can assure you, it will be grounds for recall of all those who choose to vote for a yay on that particular consent agenda item. So you'll be prepared for that. The next thing which I'm going to cover here real quick is you may not realize it, but you are not a country of your own. You are a political subdivision of the state of Washington. You might want to write this number down. It's really important. RCW 35.23.440. That gives you the specific powers enumerated. It talks about what you actually have the power to do. 
and what's not enumerated on here, you don't have the right to do. One, of course, is giving away city assets. But another thing is, and when we talk about giving away city assets, I know that with good compassion and everything, you think you're doing well. But I got to tell you, because I have so only a few seconds left, this tiny house project over here, you have no legal right to do that. It's giving away city assets. You made an emergency declaration. Your emergency declaration doesn't meet the criteria of law. You didn't put any numbers in there for prices to fix anything. The second is, is think about this. You're going to have 30 houses that you've chosen in there. You have hundreds of people out there. Each one of those houses to support on a monthly basis is over $1,700 a month to support each individual house. You have over $50,000 a month going out. I realize my time's up and I will Thank leave, you. Terry Ballard. You need to follow the law. Followed by Lee Miller. Good evening, Council. My name is Terry Ballard, and I have property, and I'm sorry to own it, at 2400 Morris Road. I've been here on 11, 18, 25 September, 2, 23 October, and 13 November, and today. You have, you're, you're a cesspool. Your city's a frickin' cesspool, let me tell you. Okay? With this new regulation that Mr. Uh, Pettit gave me, you violated number 23, 29, 34, waterways, 50, uh, sanity. You're dumping uncontrolled, unfiltered stormwater onto my property. And you're making a profit off of it by charging everybody for stormwater. Let me tell you one thing. I so far as researched all the piping up to the mayor's house. That, that stormwater goes directly into a sewer system. That's against the law. Even the governor's mansion goes into the sewer system and then go, uh, stormwater goes into the sewer sy uh, system. That's against the law. And guess what happens when Lot gets an abundance of stormwater into the uh, sewage system? They dump raw sewage into our Puget Sound. Isn't that a great feeling to have? And it's all from the city's ma mismanagement of their stormwater, of their sewer system, okay? They're responsible. They get that little stifle, okay? They are responsible. What a frickin' cesspool you are. I can't believe it. You have violated every law. And if you know any lawyer out there that d would like to do like Maytown and Rock and Gravel, and I got a listing of all the uh, ordinances that you manipulated, Okay, like calling my property an undeveloped partial versus a developed partial. I got that, but let me tell you a quick story for a minute. Here was this piece of property that this city employee bought for $40,000 less. Okay, then his city went ahead and released the developer. And the HOA came back and said, hey, that developer forgot to put in voltage, okay? So the city inspectors are supposed to do that before they release the uh, developer. And guess who paid for that voltage? Not the person that owned the property, not the HOA, but the city. The city for personal gifting of property that somebody owned. Was it, was it $40,000 less that you uh, bought that? piece of property for? Your rental property? I'm just wondering, Mr. Manager. Thank you. Lee Miller. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the City Council for every serious attempt you've made to work with the homeless issue. Um, I've been in Olympia for 20 years, and I've worked closely on the edge of the homeless population, and we know that there's no single solution to the problem. It's a very complicated issue, but I appreciate, I don't know whether the tents were a great idea or a bad idea, but we know that it's unacceptable that we've got 800 people who are living out in the winter, in the rain, and in the wind. 
I hope that you're taking any advice that you might get offered by folks like Selena Kilmoyer or Meg Martin who've worked closely with homeless folks and might have good advice on part of the solution. Um, and I just wanted to remember late, the late Archbishop Raymond Hunthausen, who used to urge his staff at every meeting that they take into consideration with every decision they made how that decision would affect the most vulnerable people in the community. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment period for this meeting. Any uh, comments from the dais? Clarifying questions from staff? All right. Councilmember Rollins? I want to thank everybody who came out tonight. And actually, uh, Lee Miller, you uh, teed up some of my thoughts the last few days really well um, about about the need if we're going to be acting ethically and responsibly with, um, frankly, the power and authority that governments have. We have to absolutely consider that. Um, along those lines, um, one initiative I'm really interested in pursuing um, this year, and it may not happen this year, but we're gonna be pursuing it, is um, a new commission. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Jones had brought brought a referral um, for a women's commission, which is kind of being refined into a human rights commission. What I see a need for is a an equity and justice commission that is internal review to city policies to make sure that we're operationalizing equity, justice, fairness, accountability, which really is just about increasing our trustworthiness and making sure that we're doing excellent work. You know, we have a planning commission to review our policies, to our land use policies, to make sure that they are compliant with our comprehensive plan and with the Growth Management Act and other relevant documents. Um, and I, I really see room for a commission that can increase our trustworthiness as an institution. Um, Talana Reed, I want to thank you for coming tonight, too. I know it's difficult to come here in this room and with the panel of seven of us. Um, I don't have the answers to the questions you're asking. I'm not even sure how I would really get the answers to some of them. Um, I honor that you're asking the questions. I honor your loss. I want you to know that I respect your intuition. And um, as I mentioned last time, I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one as well. Thank you again. All right, anybody else? I just want to thank uh, Sarah Pate once again for coming in and highlighting all the relevant uh, activities that are at the our public libraries. I'm a, a re, I don't know what you, um, reconstituted library fan with my new work down in South County and uh, what the your regional library system provides for you free of charge with just a library card is amazing. I had no, no idea. So thanks for uh, showing up and, and sharing that story. All right, with that, we uh, have a motion, or I need a motion to approve tonight's consent calendar. I'm gonna do it in a second. Second. Um, I'm gonna pull, uh, I have a second, I'm gonna pull item 4C for separate action. Any other questions, comments, or polls? Hearing none, I'm going to uh, go ahead and take um, uh, all in favor of approving tonight's consent calendar minus item 4C, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. Item 4C is, sorry, let me tab ahead here. Is it approval of a resolution authorizing a fence and easement agreement between the City of Olympia and Veterinary Specialists, LLP? I'd move approval. Um, any other uh, I'd like to recuse myself madam mayor from this vote wonderful so we've got a motion's been seconded we have a recusal from council member partially all in favor say aye. aye aye opposed motion passes consent calendar is done we're on to other business we have two items tonight item 6a is approval of Olympia's 2019 legislative agenda there was a draft agenda included in our packets that's open for discussion and 
we've got a long session this year. It's the a budget year, 105 days, we hope, or less. Huh. So, uh, yeah, Assistant City Manager Jay Burney. Good evening, Madam Mayor, <coughs> members of Council. For the record, I'm Jay Burney. I'm the Assistant City Manager. I'm here tonight to present <coughs> the proposed legislative agenda for our upcoming 2019 legislative session. In terms of process, the items that are on the agenda in front of you tonight, they come from discussions amongst our executive team, our lobbyist team, council at some prior meetings. Uh, and we talked today just quickly about a different process next year where we might bring this forward to council as part of a study session. Maybe we can combine it with the ledge overview so council can have more time to discuss this up front before you see it. So that's a, that's a change of the process we'll be looking at to make for next year. But in terms of uh, tonight, for tonight's purposes, uh, <clears throat> everything that we're going to talk about is up for discussion and conversation. Uh, the goal for tonight is to gain council approval of a final list of priorities to share with our legislative delegation at our upcoming legislative breakfast on January 11th. Our proposed legislative agenda for the 2019 session includes uh, state resources and support to address homelessness, affordable housing, mental health, and chemical dependencies. This is a holdover from last year. Um, as we know, Olympia has the highest percentage of rent burdened households and the highest concentration of the county's homeless. We will continue to look for ways to influence statewide policy around affordable housing options, including fully funding the housing trust fund, easier permitting for tiny home villages, tenant protections, and revenue streams dedicated to cities for affordable, houses, to name, affordable housing to name a few. We also have funding for the new US 101 interchange ramps in West Olympia. Uh, you've been briefed on this before. The Cooper Point Road Black Lake Boulevard intersection is, is failing and addressing congestion and in this critical area requires more access from US 101 to Olympia. And we'll be seeking, continue to be seeking funding options to further design and construction efforts. We also have funding and policy guidance for research <clears throat> and future projects to address sea level rise. Uh, as we all know, our downtown is vulnerable to widespread flooding, choking vital transportation corridors and closing our business district. The plan here is to, seek, is to seek state funding for a sea level rise demonstration project. And then finally, funding for a new first responder regional training center. This is a request for $4 million in partnership with Lacey, Tumwater and Thurston County for a new regional training center that would allow local law enforcement agencies to take more cost effective and efficient approaches to training. In addition to these priority areas, on the back <coughs> of the legislative agenda includes a list of other important topics for consideration. Uh, they include climate change. Uh, the, city, the, the city supports bills related to climate emissions reduction goals, including the governor's climate legislation. Uh, so there's some solid waste legislation that the city is tracking, a number of bills on solid waste, including uh, bills on a statewide plastic bag ban, the recyclable materials list, <clears throat> compostable product labeling, and plastic packaging. The city, as we do every, most years, are pursuing a number of grants in transportation and parks, and we'll be looking at the grant funding lists. Um, we've got several projects in parks in particular that if the lists or the grants list for RCO and WRP are fully funded, we qualify for all of our grants there. Uh, prevailing wage, so this has to do with Senate Bill 5493 passed in 2018 which tied prevailing wage rates to collective bargaining agreements where feasible. The impact of that legislation is that the rates for landscape professionals in Thurston County increased from $14.41 for laborers and equipment operators to $37.67 for laborers and $62.51 for operators. Uh, in terms of impacts on Olympia, we contract with NLS, NLS Landscaping for services at city facilities and rights of way the new rates would double or perhaps triple the contracts we have in place, and this is an issue facing cities statewide. The issue here is not whether to pay prevailing wage, uh, because we firmly believe that that is important. It is, a, it is the scale of the increases <clears throat> and the methodology used uh, that we're interested in, that cities are interested in, and AWC is working on a legislative fix and asking for city support on that particular issue. Uh, funding for Capital Lake Deschutes EIS, as Council knows, this was partially funded in the 2018 uh, session at, at $4 million. This ask really is not so much about more funding on our behalf, but just that the work get completed, that the EIS work get completed. We have some condo liability reform 
um, ad assess addressing condo liability and removing barriers to create, create more affordable housing options. Um, there's a, a, a change to appendix of the International Building Code to, to help provide better construction guidance for tiny home, for building tiny homes. Um, as you've been briefed <clears throat> late last year, TCOM 911 seeks to replace its public safety radio system, and we like to support uh, that as well. And then um, we had this on our agenda a couple years back, and it's, it's still here. It's on the backside, and we can have more conversation about that this evening, which is um, tying property tax revenues to growth and removing the cap um, that's currently on, on property tax. So we also... Change my slide here. <coughs> so AWC also has a legislative agenda um, that's up here that matches in with a lot of our needs. Uh, they have uh, housing homelessness issues on their agenda as well as um, public safety. So. Again, I just, that's in your packet. Just want to make sure you're aware. Uh, Council Member Bateman uh, sits on the legislative panel for AWC and um, will be fully involved in those discussions. In terms of our upcoming schedule, uh, we have our yearly legislative breakfast with our local delegation coming up on January 11th. And the 2019 session begins shortly thereafter on the 14th. And so tonight we are seeking approval of the proposed 2019 agenda. And with that, I'll turn it back to you for any questions or comments you might have in addition. And we've got several staff here to answer quest key questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, I know we got an e some emails going around today about the prevailing wage. And then there was a, a list from Councilmember Cooper as well. So, um, but I saw your finger first. So we'll go with Council Member Bateman. My finger was first, but I know emails happened before that. So I'll make mine brief. There was a lot to cover for those legislative priorities. I was really happy to see, and I know we're not alone in making sure that affordable housing is a priority. This is gonna be a significant year for affordable housing and mental health, which are both um, inextricably linked. And um, I wanted to let folks know in the audience that are here that are passionate about housing, I would encourage you to go to the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance website, click on the left hand side of the screen, and you can subscribe to action alerts. So as they move forward with their legislative agenda during the session, you can get linked in and go and advocate for this issue. They're a very progressive housing organization. They have a longer legislative priorities list specifically focused on affordable housing than we do. And it's really important that all the folks in our community are going and advocating at the state level for a state level fix and increased funding. Um, I was also really happy to see the condo liability. Um, that's also mirrored with the AWC as a priority we hear consistently from folks that that's another way that we can increase housing in our community. Also reducing the barriers through the Washington State Building Code with the, for building tiny homes. Um, so I'm sure other council members will wanna comment on the prevailing wage issue. Um, I would just note that this was not an issue that we discussed until this meeting. I was not aware of it. And um, considering we do not have any legislation to look at and review, I would really prefer that we move this to a watch item and take part in those discussions as the legislative session progresses versus having it as a stated priority item. Oh, and um, the solid waste legislation, having served on the Solid Waste Advisory Committee, a lot of the discussions surrounding um, the impacts of the China sword and the different um, ramifications in our community, the priority really does need to be um, for the manufacturers of those products to bear some of the responsibility for how we dispose of them and also encouraging more alternative materials like compostable items so we can reduce the total number in our waste stream. Thank you. Um, when, I just want to clarify, when you said we hadn't s s talked about it, you meant you on the AWC Legislative Committee? Um, I, the prevailing wage issue is not something that I remember us hearing about. It's oh, relatively us. new. But, you, but it was discussed at your Legislative Committee, the AWC? Mm, the prevailing wage was not, no. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. So who would like to go next? Sure. Okay, thank you, Mayor Selby. Uh, so I had a, several items I emailed, so I'll, I'll truncate this a little bit. Um, 
because you saw it and keep it pertinent to this. I, I think the first comment I'll make is I had a great conversation with Jay earlier this afternoon about front loading this process in the second half of the prior year rather than trying to act on a document that's already been through graphic design. So I feel bad making suggestions at this point, but I'm going to anyway. Um, so the first two items on my list are uh, adding a request for a statewide predictive scheduling law and also asking for comprehensive tax reform. And I would combine those in a category called equity. And I believe that they are the largest needs of Washington State's people at this time in history. Um, I can give background if we need it, but I'll keep going for now. Um, the TCOM radio system, I think it would be good to have a hard ask with the dollar figure associated in, in our document. I also think it would be good to have our lobbyists uh, and maybe Jay sit down with the TCOM leadership and staff and see if we can help them formulate what I think will be a very viable capital budget request. I appreciate the comment about asking to complete the EIS rather than add additional funding to the EIS. I don't believe that that's a good use of tax dollars to add more money to that scope of work at this time, but I do want it done. Um, this, the count, the plan, or sorry, the finance committee recommended that we add uh, the creation of a Washington State bank to our agenda because of the process that we went through to realize that there are no banks for us to choose from uh, because of our scale and our size as a city. Um, the last one really is that we, I'd like to see us ask really more specifically for a removal of the 1% cap on annual property tax for all of the reasons that we've con continually talked about. Um, when it comes to funding government, that is the thing that restricts us the most and in fact turns into a long-term loss of revenue for us over time. Um, so those are the, the comments I would make. Um, I struggle, <laughs> Jay and I went around about this a little bit this afternoon, but I struggle with everything I want on the list, I want on the front page. So I think everyone will see the front and the back. Um, in fact, I would say we should just decide what's on there now and let staff figure out what where it lies in the document based on our conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councilmember Gilman. So I, I like the four legislative priorities. Um, and I, I really have an interest in our pursuing Olympia's city specific interests with the legislative priority document. And I just expect that with um, some of these other broader issues that we will both assist when the AWC has something that we agree with that, <coughs> that we'll, we'll throw in, that we've done that historically. And then I also believe on, on issues like the equity issues that we might make resolutions, we might individually speak to legislators, but I'm, I'm interested in um, making sure that we're advocating for ourselves as Olympia. Um, it seems like both to the legislature and to the, the larger managing agencies like DES that we could, we could stand to do more uh, self-advocacy. We're getting the best deal we can as the capital city. So, that, so my interest is to keep this legislative priorities relatively short and really specific to the, the current interests of the city and to use other devices like working together with other cities in the Association of Washington Cities or using council resolutions um, to, uh, to address those broader issues. Thank you. Councilmember Parshley? I like the uh, four issues here, but I would take it one step further on the homelessness response and say that we need to also advocate for cities who are standing alone without a lot of their county help and regional partners and finding a way to have the state help us encourage regional participation, as well as helping us develop new revenue streams for the cities that are bearing a majority of the weight. Because while we are spending directly money, we are also spending indirectly a fair amount of money through public works and parks that aren't accounted in our budget directly to the homelessness crisis. And it would be nice if the cities that are around the state carrying this weight have additional revenue sources, which include something that I sent out to the council which would be a way to look at the property cap uh, tax lift that would potentially allow us to use a percentage of that lift directly towards housing and homelessness. Um, so I would encourage us to do that. And I know that the mayor has talked about trying to get some of the other mayors in this state 
to write a letter to the governor, and I would like that to be part of our process as well. Um, I'm going to echo just a couple other things. I really, I do think we need to help TCOM here get some leverage with our local legislative uh, uh, representatives and senators, because this is a heavy lift for them. This is long overdue to get this upgrade and a new tower. Um, it's shameful that during a, a train crash a year ago, we had to have fire department members from different uh, jurisdictions having to stand next to each other because our radios were not interconnected mm -hmm. and we had to have a game of telephone between the first responders. So I would like to have us put that as one of the higher priorities, see if we can't do what Council Member Cooper said. That's pretty much it. All right. Anybody else? I've got some things if you're ready. Um, are you, oh, sorry. Oh, Councilmember Bateman. Uh, just a process question. It sounds like there's a lot of things that we would like to add, and that is up to the council to make that decision. Another option is to um, keep it shorter. When you go in and talk to legislators, having less is sometimes more. And we can also let our lobbyists know about the specific topics that we're really interested in so they can watch for those specific <coughs> bills as session moves forward, and they can sign in in support or let us know that there's an opportunity for us to come and testify. So if it's not on here or if it's, you know, like a prevalent or um, this secure scheduling, uh, predictive scheduling, those are issues we might, if we were not to include it here, we could definitely advocate for it throughout the session. So those, those are just options. If I could just make a quick comment. To yes, that. So please. In, in past years, we've not had this other issues on the backside. We've, if you remember, we've just included a welcome letter and, and thank you for all the work that they do. Um, when we start talking about all the issues, there's just a lot of them. So we decided to put these up here for you to look at. But that's another approach we could take is go back to the old format, which kind of puts uh, fills that space a different way, but use our lobbyist team and make sure they understand what all of our issues and needs are and what we'd like them to track. And that's similar to what we've done in past years. So there's that is another way we could do this. I, after meeting with the legislators of um, 22, 20, 35 um, last night, they all asked for a one page. It's, you get to this side, you're not going to get as much impact. I um, mean, you might as well use it because you got to print it, but um, you're using the paper. But I think we got a lot of words here. It's really hard to, um, to think that you're going to get as much of an impact when you've got this many listings, and some of them are pretty vague. Um, but yeah, have, we have great lobbyists. I can't say enough good things about uh, Deborah and Jen, and they are on it. So if they have this list, um, they'll they know have it <coughs> right yes, now. Yes, they do, and um, they'll be sending us regular updates where we uh, can find out when we can go up and advocate in person because we're here. So anyhow, I. I I, this, if it, this is done, it's done, but I'm just saying you're not going to get as much impact on the second page. So I'll just say it's not done. So okay. it, it, it's done. Once we receive your feedback, we're going to actually update this document before the legislative breakfast on Friday okay. and have it ready to go. So uh, Kelly and I are ready to roll to make updates to it. It, it, it looks a little more final, but it, it's just where we got to. It just needed to say draft across yes. it. Yeah. But we can update. All right, so um, I think I have consensus that maybe the prevailing wage one is more of a look and see. Don't have it on here. That opens up some, is that fair consensus? Okay. Um, pardon? And Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Thank you, Mayor Selby. So uh, I'd like to offer a suggestion. Okay. I, I think, first of all, I want to thank all of my colleagues for your input. I think we heard some good input this evening, uh, particularly about process and self-advocacy. Um, those are two points that I think we need to carry on into the future, regardless of what the legislature does with this list. I think that the, the back page carries some really important message. Oh. But given um, the short uh, attention span of our legislators uh, and the need for them to delve into just a small number, my recommendation is that we move forward with the four consensus items that we all seem to agree with and that we provide uh, guidance to our legislators, not just on the list that was here, but also uh, with the addition of those things that, that have come from the dais this evening. Uh, and that that be carried as a separate piece of communication to our lobbyists rather than to our 
legislative delegation. Does that make sense, what he's asking? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. yep. Great. Councilmember Bateman. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jones, for that. I would also recommend for the council to consider when we give that separate list to our, legis our lobbyists um, that we prioritize if it's a watch item or if it's a support item or possibly an oppose item mm -hmm. so they can then know how to communicate back to us. Good tip. Councilmember Cooper. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree with narrowing. I mean, if, if we can get to that point. So I have to say really directly, every single problem we have is driven by inequity. And a lot of it is about wage and scheduling and about the uber regressive tax system we have in our state. And so to not have that at the top of a four point agenda and to be talking about, I mean, can we work housing and homelessness into some com comments around equity? Because that's all driven by the same underlying factor. I, that, that's, that's really my, my, my biggest comment in where we are in the conversation right now. Like we, we have some problems and a few more houses aren't gonna fix them. Noted, I, I would come back at that a little bit and just say I think the biggest issue above um, secure scheduling is, is tax reform. Is 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 our you know, our regressive tr you know state tax structure is the highest priority that it affects everything down below, and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't even I wouldn't put secure scheduling in that same category. I just think it's so much bigger than that. But that's just my opinion. So. I think the lack of secure scheduling probably impacts the same people a second time. If you really dig into who we're talking about, the people who are most regressively taxed are the people who um, work fast food jobs for major corporate chains we, we could, yeah, hours we could a talk week for with no, no <laughs> health care to get around yeah. Obamacare, like, period. That's a, another topic for another time, I think. Councilmember yeah. Bateman? This is why we need a process. That, that's my last comment for the evening. Councilmember yeah. Cooper, I have a question. Um, do you know of any legislation being put forward for secure scheduling? It's my understanding that um, a, a couple of representatives are working on a bill, including Representative Stonier, who I think is out of Vancouver, and then also that Working Washington is gearing up for predictive scheduling uh, in the legislature this, se legislature this session. I would. W when we evaluated this, it, it's a big. I'm not issue. arguing with you at all. I completely agree, and um, we do have a limited number uh, amount of space, so. I do think it's valuable, if we're gonna take the information off of the second page, we could put a statement in about how tax reform really is the foundation of how we have the ability to provide services and generate revenue. And our legislators know that we have the most regressive tax system in the entire country, and it is a, a top of mind for them. We could put a note about that and then just add the prevailing wage issue to our watch list. That's- what Prevailing wage, you mean? I mean- <laughs> Predictive scheduling. Predictive scheduling. Yep. So you know, as we put a letter on the back side that talks about the upcoming session, they already know what's on the front side. We could just, in generality, just kind of talk about some of the other issues of interest without a bulleted list, but kind of have some other things there, predictive scheduling being one of them, um, and a couple of the other things I think we can cover in a, in a letter on the back side. Yeah, that would, I think that would entail, and Councilmember Rollins has something. I just wanted to add that I too would, uh, of all the issues would like to see some kind of statement of support for reforming the regressive tax structure. I think it's pretty yep. foundational. We can do that on the Yeah, our side. And we all agree on and, uh, Council Member Cooper. I said I wouldn't make another comment, but we do have a really recent study of, on tax regressivity that we could email as an attachment to the entire legislature. Might be helpful. I, uh, yeah. I'm getting differing opinions on email and how effective email is. I don't know what's the most effective way, Councilmember Bateman. Um, I would say that sending a study is probably not the most effective use of our political capital in reaching our legislators. Um, the Washington Budget and Policy Center has some really great information. I think, I think our 22nd legislative district legislators are very interested in tax reform. I think if we were to put a couple of sentences in our cover letter to say first and foremost, Everything that we do is impacted on our limited ability to generate revenue to provide basic services and comprehensive services. I think that gets at the heart of it right out the gate and then we go into our bulleted items. 
Councilmember Gilman. So I, I'm trying to understand. I I thought this was sort of the what are the the pretty pragmatic, specific asks, infrastructure sorts of things, right? That that we want to work on that other folks aren't going to work on, and somebody else isn't going to speak up. So I have a couple of questions. One is how many clients do the the legislative advocates that we've contracted with, how many clients do they have? Is it realistic to expect that they would go sign in on our behalf on a bill, or are they more tracking and, and giving us opportunities to go up and, and present? So that, that's, I mean, just, if I could just finish. So, so that's why I, I absolutely think that the inequity in our state and the regressive tax system are, are huge fundamental issues. I just don't know that there's a vehicle that with a small amount of legislative advocacy resources we have that we would be supporting. Um, and, and so that's why I was interested in the, the four items at the top of the list. I thought that was a, kind of a to-do list that Jay grabs other senior staff people and works with our, our advocates to try to further those agendas. So I'm not trying to speak against a more fair economy. I'm just trying to figure out what the work is for this document and what the work is for the contracted services. Would you like me to? Yes, when so, bring it home, Jay. So the idea is that your items on the front, your forefront, those, are, those should be the items specific to Olympia. You've hired lobbyists to work on issues specific to Olympia. Those are, those are the items that you'd put forward for them to spend a majority of their time on. Now there, we always give them a list every year that comes up through emails from you. And every time I get an email from one of you that's something you're interested in, I pass it along to them. And they track. And then as you'll remember, once the session starts, you'll start to get a weekly report, a weekly update from them. And it'll range across the board on things that you've shown interest in. And if, when you get that report, if there's something missing from that, you can let me know or let Jen and Deborah know. And they'll add something to that report. And they'll track. And then on the things that they're tracking, they, they may not be setting meetings and having hard conversations like they do on the, four, on the four major topics that we have. But if they're tracking something and see an opportunity for a hearing or an opportunity where we could lend a voice, they reach out to me and then and I will reach out to one of you or one of our senior staff and then ask if one of you are available to come and testify. And so that's kind of how it has worked and, and I think it can continue to work that way. And as you see things on the weekly report, um, we can expand or shrink as you get it. Sound good? All right. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, we, I think we are, you heard from us that next year we'd like to have a little bit more time with this in We're the fall. We're planning a different process for next yes. year. Right. Okay, I've got Councilmember Cooper followed by Councilmember Bateman. Thank you, Mayor Sylvia. I actually have a, a question about that. Is it too late for general government to work in planning a process for this into its work plan for this year? No. Okay. So mm -hmm. could we good timing. do that without a referral? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. We'll talk about it at the retreat. No. <laughs> Councilmember Bateman. Just a point of clarification to make uh, Jen and Deborah's life easier and us more effective. Are we going to send out a document where we can do a watch or maybe you could make a recommendation on priority or watch or possibly oppose to yeah. give to Deborah and Jen? Yeah, I heard that comment. And as, as we, we, we'll sit down as a staff and go back through this and develop kind of that list. Perfect. And as, as you Thank see you. the reports come out, if there's something that's on a watch that you want to move around, just give me that feedback and I'll give it back to them. Appreciate it. Okay, so there's a motion that's needed. Um, can someone make a motion to approve the proposed 2019 legislative agenda for Olympia? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You got it. Thank you. Item 6B, approval of the annual city council retreat agenda. This is like riveting, you guys. <laughs> like I said. So exciting for our community to hear about our council retreat schedule. And I'm going to hand this over to uh, Steve Hall, our city manager. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So what you have on your desk is the latest version of the city council's retreat agenda for this weekend, Friday, January 11th, and Saturday, January 12th. Um, Nancy Campbell, who is your facilitator, did interviews with council members and developed this agenda based upon those interviews. Today at noon, uh, Mayor Selby, Mayor Potem Jones, and I had a chance to talk to Nancy, so there's some slight revisions, so please make sure you're working off the most current version. Uh, my job is to take any final changes that you have to this. I will point out um, one thing that's not obvious on Saturday. We have planned a walking tour and um, lunch at 11.15 um, to 12.45. In the past, we've visited a couple downtown locations. Our proposal this year 
is that we'd put the council on a bus and we'd go down and visit the mitigation site. And then secondarily, we're trying to arrange a tour of the new Annie's Artist Flats project in downtown Olympia, but that is not yet confirmed. So that's our tentative plan for your lunch hour to see those two locations. So with that, I'll take any additional changes you have about the agenda for this weekend. Any uh, Council Member Cooper? Thank you, Mayor Selby. Just one question, Steve. I, I think the most common comments we've had around the uh, retreat agenda is talking about our referral process. And I don't see that, but maybe it is moving yeah, we, forward. Uh, we talked <laughs> we, about, we talked about that, it today. Yeah. And it is included. Looking Role in setting priorities. Yes. Uh, I, on Friday afternoon at 4 p.m., that's where we intend under setting priorities. That's where the the referral process is intended to be discussed. Yeah, Nancy's been, she's very engaged around making sure we touch on that. Good, yeah, it was just kind of coded. And um, <laughs> and so then the only other comment I would make is it generally looks too ambitious for the time. It always does. <laughs> it's always. We always end up done. I joked that the staff report actually showed that we were going till 5 p.m. on Saturday. What do you say? Come on. We could legally do it. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll try and keep Nancy's it. She's it. She'll keep us on track. We're, yeah. we're here all weekend, whatever you need. All right. Any other discussions on the agenda? All right. I'd so, move approval. Move to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have an agenda. We get to spend a lot of time together this week. Um, council reports. I. Your new five things is out, and it fell out of my folder over the break, so I can't highlight it. But it's one of our um, one of our shining ways that we do outreach, which is through our utility billing statements. Have the five things every other month, and uh, the utility, the public works department, does a great job of producing that document. It keeps you up to date on all things public works, um, as well. The new Thurston County Historical Journal is out, and this is a a journal that the council. Uh, Fund, helps fund regionally, another regional partnership, and uh, there's all kinds of topics in there, and um, there's a, a home in Olympia that they focus on, and it's the Truman and Virginia Schmidt House, which is a mid-century um, icon. So check it out. Any um, questions? All right, so I'll start with my left, Councilmember Cooper. Happy New Year. I have nothing to report. All right, Councilmember Rollins. I second that. <laughs> Councilmember Bateman. Ditto. Council Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Thank you, Mayor Selby. I have nothing to report. Councilmember Gilman. Glad to be back, and I'll have more next week. <laughs> All right, Councilmember Parshley. Happy New Year. Nothing to report. Woohoo! You guys lucked out. Uh, well, I hesitate, City manager. but there is some important public information I'd like to share with you. A couple weeks ago, a member of the public um, was here and spoke about crime rates in Olympia and said that Olympia had the highest crime rates in the state of Washington in crimes per 1,000 in Group A offenses, which are major crimes. So we didn't think that was right, so we actually went and looked. And so this is a list of the highest crime rates per 1,000 in the state of Washington. And we're way down the list. We're, we're not, this isn't all the list, but we're way down the list. So I, I'm not sure where that information came from, but Olympia is right in about the average of cities in King, Snohomish, Pierce, and Lewis County. Not, not that we wouldn't have, right, have it lower, but that was, uh, uh, I'm not sure where the numbers came from, but this is an accurate representation of crimes per thousand. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that clarification. That's all I have. Yeah. All right, any questions for the city manager? All right, you guys, rest up. We got a lot of time to spend together this weekend. With no further business before the Olympia City Council, we're adjourned. <laughs>